It's probably okay. Oh, Lordy, y'all. What a week, huh? What a week. If I put this on the carpet, I might be less likely to slip. Hey, Dave. Hello. Hello, Pat. Yeah, somebody's dragging behind in here, too. Okay. Oh, awesome. <laughs> so, um, Beth, I'll tell you, if, if all goes well, um, if all goes well and we are still able to, uh, Allison and I are traveling to Portland at the end of this month uh, to go to Britt Carlson's wedding. Y'all remember Britt? Pastor Rich, she's getting married. Yeah, and uh, it's it's outside Portland, so uh, we're hoping to be able to be there just for a few days for that. Are you conducting it? Say again? Are you doing the wedding? No, just uh, just attending. Uh, if you've not priced rent cars lately, I got mine a long time ago. So uh, we haven't reserved one yet because uh, a compact car in Portland right now for four days, the cheapest we can get is seven hundred dollars. I know, right? Say what? Uh, yes, and that's actually more expensive in this case. Yeah, and it just, it's bizarre. You know, it's really, really bizarre. Uh, so, hello everyone who's joining us um, online and at some time in the future. Uh, it's August 1st in the second year of the pandemic. Uh, we'll do this in biblical terms. Seems like, uh, dear God, here we are. And uh, I am like 12 feet away from anyone in this room, which is why my mask is off uh, at this point. And I've also been tested twice this week and know for a fact I don't have COVID. Um, I will tell you this. I've, I've been participating in a UT Southwestern longitudinal study on people who had COVID. And so uh, I had COVID in November, second week of November, um, was tested first time in that, that study for antibodies in late January. And on the big scale of COVID antibodies, I registered 1.6, which was a strong response, but not like you, have it, like you currently have COVID, right? That would be like a six kind of deal. So definitely protection there. I went back this week and was tested for the next part of the series. So the, my first number was 1.6. My current number for antibodies is 0 0.13. So it is one tenth of the antibodies that I had in January. So I say that to say, if you are depending upon antibodies to protect you long-term from COVID, you're gonna be sorely disappointed because there is a drop off to it, uh, to that. Uh, because I had the Pfizer vaccine, it doesn't show up uh, in the antibody testing. It's a different thing. So. I appreciate you saying that so much. I'm going to go home and tell my sister, my brother in law, and everybody I see because they're all just an idea. Right, there is this idea. And I've had the idea too, and I was shocked to see my numbers. Where did you go to do it? Uh, so this, the, way, way back, they were recruiting online and I signed up and I've been to different places. You know, they, for a while they were running a thing up here at Presby, um, but now it's all out of UT Southwestern. I have something else to tell you that you were right about. Okay. <laughs> I visited my doctor just fixed up primary care this week and we were talking about different things. She said, well, how are you doing? I said, well, physically I'm doing okay, but mentally, eh, you know, everything's happened. So she said that all of her friends that are therapists are booked way out. She said this thing has had a toll on the mental of people. That is absolutely true and still true. And Susan's shaking her head yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. Uh, indeed. There are two places that she said that people are going for the talk space and what's the other one? Behavior something anyway. That you get online and 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, today is supposed to be the last lesson in this series to tell the truth. And as I worked on this lesson, I realized this last, this last one is probably going to take more than one week to get through. Uh, and I'm just going to tell you up front, it's a hot mess. Uh, I, I don't like where this lesson is and I need your help. Uh, so I, I've got a few things I want to say that I hope will prompt some conversation from you and you can help me shape this and we will sort of work through it over about a two week period. Um, my idea had been to talk about telling the truth about ourselves and by ourselves, uh, I mean both individually and corporately. Um, and it occurred to me after I sweat blood over this, uh, as I was driving down here a few minutes ago, that I completely overlooked the most obvious illustration from this week for this very topic, and that is Simone Biles. Right? Uh, so it's been fascinating to, to see how that little drama has played out. It's not a little drama, it's a big drama. Uh, with her withdrawing herself from competition, uh, it, and the explanation that's been given about uh, her own mental health and what's called the twisties, uh, that a w phrase that will now forever be in our vocabulary, uh, I think, right? Um, and you may have noticed that uh, she, she got both praised and skewered, uh, and, and sorry to say, but most of the people who were skewering her were older white men who have never done a gymnastics routine in their lives uh, and just need to shut up. But, uh, you know, and who knows what people were thinking who didn't, didn't speak out. But anyone who has been in that world was very sympathetic to her. Uh, and a lot of mental health professionals, a lot of pastors are speaking out saying, you know, this is a, this is a, a real thing. I read an article uh, overnight when I was uh, dog sitting, the dog that would not sleep, um, that was a, a, col a columnist uh, for one of the major news outlets who was saying uh, she, not he, she had been hard on Simone Biles earlier on like on Tuesday, but by Saturday had changed her mind because the more she understood about what had happened and the effect it would have on her teammates. And here's the point I want to make about Simone Biles. You may look at her and say, well, that was really selfish. But in reality, with some hindsight, we can see that this was actually a very selfless thing for her to do, to remove herself. Because what she did, and I think one of her concerns, I can't get inside her head, but it seems that one of her concerns was that she thought she would bring down the team. That she did not trust herself. She knew that she was not up to top form. That would not only make her look bad, but it would, it would risk the standing of the entire team. And the second thing that happened was by pulling herself out, she allowed a space for one of her teammates to win a medal who would not have won a medal otherwise. She won the gold for teammates. Right. And this just happened like yesterday, right? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, yesterday there, or yes, well, yeah, it's, I think we haven't seen it yet, right? Uh, and that is a remarkable thing to acknowledge. So here's, the, here's the, the connection for our lesson today. I want us to talk again about telling the truth about ourselves. The really brave thing that Simone Biles did on a global stage was to tell the truth about herself, to say, I am not functioning well. Now, that is a tremendous amount of courage. I, I, you know, I, I don't think there are many of us who would have the wherewithal on a global stage like that to say, wait a minute, <laughs> I think I might hurt myself and others <laughs> in, the, in this process. And that, to me, is a really great illustration of the power of knowing yourself. I, I'm, I'm reminded of this line that's, well-known uh, from Shakespeare, to thine own self be true. Uh, Shakespeare put these words in the mouth of uh, Polonius, 
in Act 1, Scene 3 of Hamlet. And in, in this particular scene, uh, they're spoken as advice to a son who's leaving on a journey. Sort of the way we might speak advice to a child or have a heart-to-heart -heart with a child as they're heading off to college or beginning a career or joining the military, right? That kind of really important milestone moment where you're sending, you know, a, a, a child off into the world and you, and in this case, Polonius says, to thine own self be true. These have to rank among Shakespeare's most well-known words, but what's interesting is people still disagree about what they mean. And Nancy, I'm sure you've taught this before and, and could help us explore the, the various meanings of to thine own self and to the word true and what that means. As with a lot of good literature, we can find the meaning needed in the moment uh, from that. That's why it's a good illustration, right? But while researching this, I was really shocked to run across a pastor, a Baptist pastor, no less, who I'm sure is not alone in this, who used this illustration to preach about the dangers of giving in to the self. Uh, the, the sermon is the opposite of what I thought it would be. Uh, to thine own self be true, he said, is example of, what's, of everything that's wrong with the world today because people are only concerned about being true to themselves and not true to God. And if you're true to yourself, you can't be true to God. Well, I get it. He's sort of wrapped up in original sin and total depravity and all that stuff. Um, but he seems to begin with the idea that we're all so evil and bent away from God that we can't be true to self and live godly lives at the same time. And I think that's sort of messed up. That, that's, a, that's not a great theology, but it illustrates, I think, one of the ways Christianity damages people emotionally and spiritually. Preachers and teachers do harm when they insist that our authentic selves must never be trusted, never let out, because our inner self is thoroughly corrupt. Now, I know this is a popular teaching in certain Christian circles. Total depravity, after all, is one of the five pillars of Calvinism. But apart from John Calvin and his disciples, both past and present, many other Protestants mean something different when they speak of original sin or total depravity. So, for example, John Wesley, uh, the preeminent founder of Methodism, he believed in, he affirmed the doctrine of total depravity, but with some caveats to it. Specifically, he did not believe that all people continue to be totally depraved until their regeneration or conversion, the way Calvin taught. Also, he taught that humans are not left to suffer what he called, I love this phrase, the unalleviated evils of total depravity. <laughs> we are not left to suffer the unalleviated evils of total depravity. And here's, here's the money line from him on this. The atonement has not only secured grace for him, meaning a person, but a measure in him by virtue of which he not only has moral light, but is often incited to good desires and well-intended efforts to do what is perceived to be the divine will. In that sense, to be true to ourselves may mean to be true to the divine image of God within us. So from a non-Calvinist perspective, I would say that the fall of humanity, the, the arrival of sin into the world, cast a sinful bent over God's good creation. So when we argue, so we, we could argue then that to be true to self is to dig down underneath that layer of human temptation and to find the authentic person we were made by God to be. Does that make sense at all? Let's pause for some comment. Yes, Jim. I'm wondering, I'm trying to follow your thesis in this. Are you referring to being true to ourselves, to ourselves, about ourselves, to ourselves, or are you talking about being true to ourselves, to others, 
Do yes. Do what? I mean, how? And there, there's the very challenge of Shakespeare's line. That's the very challenge. True to whom, about whom, right? And I want to make the case that I'm not articulating very well, and we'll get there, that if you are honest about yourself, you'll be honest with other people as well. So think about people who are proverbial liars to everyone around them. The root of that issue often is that they lie to themselves uh, and get so caught up in this thing that, uh, you know, uh, as I learned this phrase growing up, he, he wouldn't know the truth if it bit him on the butt, right? Uh, it might have been something like that, but anyhow, uh, right? I think that's the idea that there, there is a cause and effect relationship within these two things. Uh, and the root of our ability to deal truthfully with other people is to deal truthfully with ourselves. Right? Yes, Pat. I think about being true to yourself is tied to your character. And to me, your character is who you are when nobody else is watching or is listening. And that's being true to yourself. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, Pat, Pat is saying rightly that being true to yourself is about your character and how you act when no one else is looking. Um, a very true statement. And I have to say the, 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 the older I get, the longer I live, and the more we live through COVID uh, in, in particular and all the challenges that brings, uh, I, I, I agree with that assessment, but I find it harder and harder. Right? Uh, yes? It seems like we're bumped into a big problem is people that have lied to themselves for so long that they believe the lie. Yeah, so, uh, and saying the problem is when people have lied to themselves so long that they believe the lies. Yeah, this, this reminds me of this old maxim uh, in the entertainment business, business uh, never start believing your own reviews. <laughs> Because once you do, you're, you're done, right? Uh, I, I've used this illustration here before. Um, it, it, I used to get so frustrated uh, when we'd have, you know, first-year pastoral residents stand up and preach god-awful sermons sometimes. Not often, occasionally. And some, some of our sweet church members would come up. I'd be standing there, and they'd come with, oh, that was the best sermon I ever heard. And I would say, no, it wasn't. <laughs> Stop encouraging them. <laughs> they need to learn from this. That was a dog of a sermon. <laughs> yes. Well, I like that part about being down in front of who you are. I mean, don't you change all the time? I mean, certainly don't have the same ideas and even some of the interests that I did when I was 30. <laughs> you know? Right. I, I know myself a lot better and I'm much more willing not to take that I took when I was 30. Yeah, so, 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 so Lynette's saying that she is not the same person she was when she was 30, which was just a year or so ago, by the way, uh, but uh, that we change. And knowing ourself, I, this is an excellent point. Knowing ourself is a lifelong journey. It's not something you figure out once because we do change. And if you need some evidence of that, look at the past year and a half. I doubt that any of us would say we are the same person we were on March 1st, 2020, because of all we've been through. Whether you've been sick or lost anyone or not, the trauma, the challenge of the past 18 months uh, has changed who we are and how we see the world around us. We're, for one thing, we're not as naive, hopefully, as we were, um, right? I tell you where I see this the most, uh, the best illustration of this to me is my transgender friends. Uh, th these are people who have lived with the agony of knowing on the inside that they are not who they appear to be on the outside. And they've had to fake it for so long uh, in order to live up to other people's expectations about them. The amount of courage it takes to come out and say, wait a minute, this is not who I really am, 
despite the criticism that they get for that, people who don't understand what they're doing and think in being authentic, they're faking it, right? Uh, again, if you've not walked a mile in that moccasin, uh, you might keep your mouth shut uh, because we just don't know, right? Uh, but I find inspiration from my transgender friends who have the courage to say, I have not been truthful about myself, right? And very few of us in the rest of the world ever have to screw up that kind of courage. Uh, life just doesn't demand it. Yes? Major Storm, if we believe that God made us with a divine purpose, then to be true to that purpose could be true to ourselves. There's a question mark. Yeah, so I think, uh, Linda, you're getting to the question that, I, that was actually in this, this uh, preacher I was talking about earlier. Uh, is there an inherent conflict between being true to ourself and being true to God? And certain views of, you know, uh, total depravity and um, being born into sin uh, would say that there's always a disconnect there. Uh, but I'm making the case, and I think a lot of Christian theologians would make the case, that there that to be true to ourself is, again, to find the authentic God-given image in us. Now, we, we, in our time, have been through about, what, 20 or 30 years of self-esteem talk uh, that's been both good and bad. Uh, you know, uh, my kids and some of your kids and grandkids have come up from a time where everyone got a participation trophy, right? Because we don't want anyone, we don't want any kid to feel left out, uh, because we've gone for decades and millennia with lots of kids feel left out. So we're going to build up self-esteem because there were some studies done and some books written and some papers done that talked about the the power of positive self-esteem to make you better in the world. And one of the reasons this took hold in America was because of the business world applications of it. You go research this and you'll find all these seminars and things being put on in the business world to help you be a better leader, a better employee, a better worker, uh, a better whatever, uh, if, you, if you just had better self-esteem, right? And in doing that, we've probably created another problem uh, because we sometimes build people up uh, to the point that um, <laughs> we're not being honest about their real skills. This is really true in the school system. Right? Yep. We have an uneducated group of kids today, but they have good self-esteem. <laughs> <laughs> Pat says we have an uneducated group of kids today, but they have high self-esteem. Uh, so, you know, there, there's some trade-offs uh, in, in this. Um, I, I'm reminded of the wisdom of the ancient Greek philosophers, know thyself. Uh, and that's sort of the precursor to Shakespeare uh, in a way. Uh, the challenge is what we're told about ourselves. And, and I want to make the case that it's not just about high self-esteem or low self-esteem but it's about inaccurate self-esteem. Inaccurate self-esteem. Uh, we're just not able to be truthful sometimes for different reasons. So an easy example of this is to think about um, someone who thinks they have gifts that they don't have. So maybe someone who thinks that they are an excellent baker, but the food they produce is inedible. And no one in the family has the courage to tell them, this is awful, right? Uh, it, we would rather you went to the store and bought something than bring this to the potluck, please. Uh, we, we, we just sort of let that roll. Or uh, someone who, who thinks that they're a great athlete, but really has two left feet, but they love the game so much. They love to play so much, and they're such good sports that no one has the courage to say, you really can't play this game very well. Or the classic example, there have been movies made about this one, is people who think they can sing, who can't carry a tune in a bucket, but they don't know they can't sing. 
right? So this problem got to be so bad uh, in our Baptist seminaries that in somewhere in the mid 1980s, uh, by the time I started seminary, you had to get uh, a reference from your home church, not only that you were of good character and had experienced a call to ministry, but then they started asking this question. If your church had an opening that this person qualified for, would you hire them? Because what, what was happening was you had men and women, young men and women, who had been called to ministry by their mothers uh, or out of some other desperation and, and confusion in life who were ending up in seminary, taking up spaces at a point where the enrollment was through the roof uh, and then were so dysfunctional in their own personal issues that there was, there was no church anywhere that was going to hire them. And the church that endorsed them and sent them knew that because they couldn't be honest and say, you know, I think, this, I think your gifts and graces might be different than this. Because, again, participation trophy uh, kind of deal. And I know I sound like a raging conservative right now, which is shocking to you. <laughs> Someone mark this down, please. Right? Yes, Carol Ann? So lack of honesty afflicts, afflicts, us, afflicts us all, uh, which is one of the points of this lesson. I think we all have trouble being honest about ourselves. I think it's human nature, right? And uh, if we all could be honest about ourselves, once again, I'm trying to put Susan and your colleagues out of business, uh, there wouldn't be so much to talk about, right? Susan? Right. I'll never get pregnant. I'll never have a family. I'll, you know, this is not going to happen for me. You know, something wrong with me. Um, I mean, just constantly I heard that from almost everybody I worked with. That was the, you know, so I think there is that, uh, that proclivity or something. That yeah. So for those at home, Susan Leonard is saying that in her work as a therapist, uh, many, even a majority of her clients, it come with negative perceptions of themselves uh, that are tapes that play over and over again, and they, they can't seem to get out of that. Uh, I actually went digging trying to find some data on what percentage of the population has overly inflated self-esteem versus too low self-esteem, and I couldn't find that. Uh, it's got to be out there somewhere. Uh, so it may not be self-esteem, right? It's self-image. Yes. Well, it's just negative. Negative thoughts. Yeah, negative thoughts. It's uh, what we say to ourselves. What we think of our, Right, okay. Yeah, and what's going to happen uh, to us as future players. I do have some data on that in a moment. Joni? Um, to your point about the seminary and churches recommending inappropriate candidates, I learned that lesson the hard, hard way. In the early 90s, I was still full-time as a physical therapist at Baylor and had one of our staff techs ask me for a recommendation to PT school. I should have been honest enough to say, are you kidding? <laughs> I mean, th this particular individual's interpersonal skills drove me up the wall. And I just wasn't honest enough to say, I wouldn't want you touching my worst enemy, much less my family member. 
But what I did, which was really awful, I, I did the recommendation, but what I said was, so-and-so was employed, da-da-da-da, on these dates. <laughs> that was it. Come to find out, I think all the school did was look at the letterhead. He got it. And I thought, okay, learn something from this. And so I think to your mm. seminary recommendation thing, it takes honesty from the evaluator or the recommender to really decide, is this yes. someone that their gifts are suited to this position or get uncomfortable enough to say, I'm sorry, I don't think this is where you should be led. Right, whatever. right. It, I, I learned it the hard way and um, hopefully won't make that mistake again. So let me recap for those at home. Joni gives us an illustration of some years ago when she was asked to give a recommendation for someone who was applying to physical therapy school who she had worked with in a tech position who was completely unqualified and unsuitable for the role. Uh, and she didn't have the courage to refuse to give the recommendation. So she took sort of a non-confrontational uh, path through that and just acknowledged the person's employment. And the person still got into PT school. <laughs> yeah, that. Okay, I had to face this and stick to school too about colleges. And I remember one young guy was gonna go to North Texas in his freshman year and finish, I mean, sophomore year and finish up out there. And I had to actually write to them that he's smart enough to attend, but I think his maturity level would hinder him. And he did not attend. <laughs> wow. So, and Pat gives an illustration as a teacher, you know, having to write a recommendation to college in this. What's, so one bit of study I found on this uh, is uh, looking at the disconnect between what we think of ourselves and what our skills actually are. And by the way, if you've ever been subjected to a kind of uh, job evaluation by your peers, not just by a supervisor, or if you're a supervisor and you've been subjected to uh, an evaluation by those you supervise, uh, this is always chastening and, and difficult to deal with. Uh, this one study found, and I love, <laughs> it found only, and this is a quote, a tenuous to modest relationship between how people think they behave and how they actually behave. And the same study found a, quote, moderate to meager relationship between self ratings of skill and actual performance. Now here's where this comes, there, there's another aspect to this that's relevant today. Because the same study and other studies like it have found that we overestimate our ability also in our health. There is a documented phenomenon by which we are unrealistically optimistic about our own health risks. Most of it, not all of us, some of us are hypochondriacs, uh, but most of us, present company excluded, uh, are unrealistically optimistic about our own health risks compared to those of other people. We see this before us in glaring color today, right? Because one of the number one things you read from the vaccine deniers is, I'm not going to get sick. I never get sick. And, you know, facts be damned about what's happening around you, right? But you, you believe, which is why the largest age, the, the most significant age demographic for vaccine deniers is age 30 to 49 age 30 to 49. Uh, and, and again, you know, if you've not ever, I, well, I never even get the flu, and I've never had a flu vaccine, you might say, right? We, we've heard all this. Uh, but again, there's a disconnect from reality here, and we think we are immune when, in fact, no one's immune, right? But we, we tend to think our odds are better. This is what drives people to gamble. I mean, it's the same thing that, oh, well, I, I know the odds are stacked against everyone except me. 
Again, I feel lucky today, right? And I am the exception. Carol Ann? Right. Caroline's talking about gambling with your life through this. W was there another comment, Charlene? No. Okay. No. My, my take on that is that I see a lot of people, they don't get it because they don't want to be dependent on somebody else or somebody else's medicine. That's what they're going to do for me. I'm going to, I'm going to fight through this myself. If I get it, then it's going to, I'm going to work my way through it. I'm going to challenge. I'm going to step up. Yeah. I'm going to fight this myself. I'm not going to let somebody else take over control over my system. Right. I want to fight it myself. R yeah. Uh, I, want to, I want to be able to be in control. Of there are multiple streams of thought piling into this, and there's an excellent story in the New York Times today uh, online about they've taken all of the different studies uh, about vaccine acceptance and denial and delay, and they've sort of... Um, brought them together in a really interesting story I, I recommend to you. Um, here's another illustration of this I thought of, and our time's almost up uh, for today. Uh, have any of you watched the Netflix series Unorthodox? Okay, Unorthodox is based, uh, it's a series, a limited series based on a real life experience of this young woman who was raised in an ultra-Orthodox Jewish community in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, very isolating, very restrictive. Uh, she was subjected to an arranged marriage at either 15 or 16. Um, ultimately runs away from this. Ends up going to where she has uh, some family connections who are not part of the cult-like group of the ultra-Orthodox in Germany. And she ends up in Berlin. <coughs> As a child, she has secretly learned to play the piano. She's not supposed to have been allowed to do this, but there's a neighbor who she goes to see who has a piano who teaches her to play piano. She has no context for the wider world of music. And she gets to Berlin, and some, some young students at a music conservatory <coughs> befriend her. And she thinks, ah, this is my ticket into community because I also play the piano. And she manages to wrangle an audition for this prestigious conservatory. And what we learn, and you can see this coming a mile away, is her skills are rudimentary at best. But she doesn't know it because she has no context, no context for this. And yet she bases her assessment of her own ability uh, on her limited set of knowledge. And I think this is where so many of us find the disconnect between truth and re, you know, our perception of ourselves and we just lack adequate data. Where I wanna pick up and go with that next week is to expound upon how this happens to us corporately as well. Because one of the issues we're dealing with in our nation, in our culture, is coming to grips with our national and global story as well. And a lot of times the challenge is what we don't know more than what we do know. And we've talked about that before. Let me pause. Uh, as I said, this turned out to be probably more than a one week uh, conversation, but what what other th things would you add to this, and what would you poke at that maybe I could come back and pick up next week as part of this? Uh, anything that's been peaked, Jim? What, what's confusing me on all this is where we're where we're coming from, what we're doing is I always think of what does God think of us, or what yeah. do we think of us? What do we think about ourselves, and what do others think about ourselves? Or know about ourselves. Right. So it's a knowledge of who I know I am, what she knows that I am, that I don't see. Right. And what God sees that neither of us see. 
Yeah, so Jim, I, Jim has just really, uh, I think, explained the, the triangulating challenge here. Uh, it, 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 finding alignment between what God thinks of us, what we think of ourselves, and what others think of us, what is the honest assessment of who we are and what we're capable of doing, if those three things would ever line up, we'd be in a great spot, I think. But, uh, you know, we're out of alignment. Yes. Perfect example. I came in not wearing a mask. I didn't know. I, I live in Plano. I, I don't know if this is citywide or... Yeah, it's just church. I yeah. I sat next to her and... Yeah. I, I didn't mean to... But you can, but you can adapt, you right? Know. Because you're, you're in tune. And this is back to, you know, what was said earlier... Yeah, I think Lynette was the one who's, who said, we change. Uh, and if we don't change, uh, we, end up, we end up in trouble, right? And I, I think a lot, of, uh, a lot of people's issues arise over the absolute inability to acknowledge that either the situation has changed or they've changed or that they were, you know, to adapt. Uh, and tr finding truth is about adapting, and that's, Painful. Yeah. Whew. Yeah. Did you have a comment? I think as I have le listened to you over the months that I've been here, I've come to believe that you and I have a very similar background in a lot of ways in our earlier years. Yes, I think so. Although I was in Louisiana, not Oklahoma. Right. But the background I got was heavy on the judgmental aspect of Christian faith. We heard that over and over. If grace got in, it got in through the back door. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you deal with this kind of thing if you want to ever emerge out of this? And I've heard this comment made that, you know, I'm a, uh, how does it go, a, a fundamental, a, a sort of survivor of fundamentalism, you know, or something like this. And we don't necessarily need to blame fundamentalism. I just need to do an evaluation, realistic where do we really stand? Yeah. Yeah, so true. Tom? I just wanted to mention, um, I had dinner this uh, week with a 15-year-old. She was a relative. And so she reminded me of when I was in youth group here, how important it was for the dialogue to be around who are you as a person? Who makes you? You know, what's your right. Truth, you know? So right. That's when they're starting to think about that type of thing. And oh, this so, is a big, yeah, this is a big youth development issue. It's a big deal when you're 15. Yeah, 15. it is. Uh, and it can be a big deal when you're nearly 60, like me, <laughs> as well. All right, uh, for those of you who joined us online, uh, we uh, thank you, and we're going to close with a prayer, and then we'll do our prayer concerns here in the room. Again, if you have anything to add, uh, prayer concern-wise, please send it to Charlene. Uh, glad to uh, incl include you in that uh, as well. Let's pray together. Lord, we need your grace today, and we need your strength as we seek to be authentic. And uh, we acknowledge this is so hard. We pray that you would give each one here the strength that we need for this day, for not only that task, but for the tasks of daily living and for health and well-being and for service. We pray through Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, Charlene. <coughs>